Great. Okay, so um, the title of my presentation is Making Work Visible in the Theater of Service Design. And the purpose of this uh, provocation is to think about some uh, very much ingrained concepts in this field that I'm going to challenge. It will lead to a total reconfiguration of the field if you uh, believe in my uh, formulation. But that's necessary because service design is lagging behind other fields that have already gone through this process of acknowledging its uh, past association with oppressive structures. So let's start with denouncing those, uh, that association. Well, service design, as you probably know, have come through service marketing and um, interdisciplinary work with uh, industrial design, graphic design, and interaction design. But service marketing is still very much um, influential to uh, service design right now. Uh, for example, this division between front stage and backstage, which is so commonplace in service design, draws back to service marketing. This was uh, initially conceived uh, by Grove and Fisk in, 19, in the 80s, but they really uh, systematized it in the 90s. And on the left side, you see the picture from their papers that already has this similar configuration of front stage and backstage. And on the right side, you see a more, even more familiar uh, derived um, uh, diagram called uh, the service blueprint. This was the, the grandfather of the current service blueprint, uh, initially created by Schustek, but then later on, uh, um, it was improved by other uh, service marketeers and also service designers. But this theater metaphor uh, tries to uh, separate what's going on in the visible part of the service and, and, what's and what is going on in the invisible part of a service. The, the visible part, they call it front stage. Visible to whom? Visible to the customer, to the client. Of course, the service uh, providers, the workers, they are aware of what's going on but they should stay uh, as much as possible in the invisible area, which is called backstage. So you see on the left side, uh, a kind of a drawing, a, a diagram that you, is so commonplace in self-design literature and blogs and YouTube videos. And on the right side, you see the practical implementation of this vision, which is this uh, modern, the contemporary self-design blueprint with this line of visibility in the middle separating what should be seen from the customer perspective and what should not be seen. Well, the most uh, important example of uh, the advantages of hiding what's going on in the backstage is Disneyland. And there is a, a book uh, that discusses this issue in length called The Experience Economy. It's a classic book in service design literature, although it's not uh, focus on service design. It's more about experience design and experience economy in general. But um, the important thing is that this book makes it very accessible and understandable why work should be treated as theater. And they say, well, customers want to be delighted. They want to have memorable, memorable experiences. They don't want anything that will somehow provide a hiccup or uh, a breakdown in their process, in their flow. And this is considered to be the most uh, uh, highest value, highest value offer in the capitalist economy, the experience. Well, this is something that we usually do not question because we think it's great, right? And then we devise new uh, methods and techniques based on this uh, theater metaphor. And the most literal ones are experience prototyping and body storming. Uh, popularized by Bushido and Suri, who were at the times uh, design researchers at IDEO. And uh, this image is everywhere. You see people uh, experiencing how uh, an airplane, a new airplane would function, how the, the services, uh, airline service would be provided in this new setting. And they would experience what it's like to be um, piled up like you were like <coughs> animals inside them an airplane, so you see some people trying to sleep on, on above each other <coughs> and experience how bad that could be. From an embodied perspective, you might notice better than if you're just <coughs> drawing or if you are uh, making a diagram. 
And that's the advantage they claim uh, body Army and experienced prototype to have. Well, if you invite uh, customers, clients, stakeholders to join these kind of activities, they become co-design, right? And this has been uh, very well structured by uh, TU Delft researchers like uh, Peter von Stappers and uh, Elizabeth Sanders, who is sometimes a visitor there. And however, co-design, especially as practiced in TU Delft, usually focus very much on the front stage still, and the, where the backstage remains something uh, for other professionals to work with. And why is that? Why co-design is rarely seen at the backstage? <clears throat> because service design reproduces this theatrical, and I, I would add, capitalist premise that work should be invisible and interfaces should be transparent so that the customer, the client, does not have anything in between his goal or desire so he can fulfill the desire clearly and do not pay attention to anyone who is around working for the uh, fulfillment to happen. Well, what happens, is what, what is the downside of this is that invisible work is easily divided, managed, optimized and exploited by capitalists. And that's away from customer scrutiny and public accountability. So what's happening in the uh, overall perspective is that service design is contributing to a society that tries to hide work uh, under some kind of a digital structure or physical structure uh, that becomes away from uh, our uh, public conversation and that's why sometimes a lot of abuses and oppression happens because it's not visible and also it's not well paid because it's invisible and what workers can do to uh, <clears throat> make their work visible again is striking so when you see uh, digital service workers like uh, delivery couriers uh, or uh, Uber drivers striking, it seems like, wow, this is old fashioned, right? <laughs> Why they are doing something that workers needed to do at the beginning of the 20th century to draw attention to that exploitation? If you are now having uh, social networks with so, ca so many kinds of uh, uh, public spheres that you can post messages, why do they have to go on streets and, 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 and protest like in the old-fashioned way? It's because that's the only way that people can notice that they are real people. <laughs> they are oppressed, they are suffering from these exploitative systems that pay too, um, too, uh, not enough for them and especially they do not offer any kind of uh, social security. Well, what can service designers do in this context, right? What, how they can make work visible and perhaps more prone for scrutiny and also for um, question, raising questions of social justice. Well, we need to find another theater metaphor, right? And that's what I'm doing uh, in research in the last uh, years uh, based on theater of the press created by a Brazilian dramaturg called Augusto Subal. He wrote a book with this title, but also plenty of other books, and he, he's been in many different countries uh, disseminating these practices. And in a nutshell, theater is work for him. So theater is not uh, art per se, and art per, for art. It's really work because it is about transforming reality by representing that reality in a different way. So we start acting in reality differently after we see reality in the way theater of the press conveys it. And usually the theater of the oppressors, the dominant classes, they control that, that kind of theater and try to represent their ideas, gestures and rituals and convey ideology through a theater. And that's also can be extended to cinema, can be extended to many other kinds of media, and what uh, Boao is was try trying to do is to claim that the oppressed should have access to those uh, media, to their means of production of theater, and that's why he developed an approach and a methodology for anyone who wants to say something publicly to do that using theater. If we compare uh, structurally the proposal of theater of the oppressed on the right side where theater of the oppressors or the current capitalist theater metaphor of service design, you see there's a huge difference how theater of the press deals with work. So whereas a theater of the oppressor tries to hide work from the front stage to the backstage so that the protagonist or the client or the customer 
or the user actions become like a powerful or magical. So it seems like uh, it comes out from the virtues of the user, of the customer. In theater of the past, the work is made visible right at the center of the stage, which is not called stage any longer, it's called aesthetic space, a place where anyone can uh, join, can enter, especially audience who are now in called spect actors. And it's a mixture of spectators and actors because they can, any time they, they would like to, join the play and replace some uh, actors who are already there and try their ideas in this uh, uh, theater, in this play, so that they can see if they will work in real life. And this all is facilitated and sometimes complicated by jokers. Jokers are uh, these um, jackal round uh, people that can do anything in a theater production and it's also the ultimate goal and ideal of a theater of the press that everyone who joins a, a session becomes a joker, someone who's capable of reproducing the same method elsewhere if needed. But to get to this position of being able to do everything you need or everything you, you, uh, your community needs, you need to demechanize your body and your muscles because they are uh, accustomed, they are used to, they are optimized to perform some repetitive structures in, the, in a factory or in a service setting. So you're always trying to smile to people when they are shouting at you, for example, in some service uh, uh, encounters. And that's something that is mechanized. So it's not real, what the, that smile. It's not genuine. It's just fake smile because you need to do that because you are trained to do that. Because service designers told you that this should be better for the company or for the customer brand. And if you want to be truthful to your feelings and display your, express your feelings in a genuine way, you need to demechanize your gestures, your facial expressions. And that's what this uh, embodied uh, experience uh, with uh, theater of the press tries to do. After you are demechanized, then you can start rehearse reactions to oppression. And this process of trying out, uh, what can I do as an oppressed against the oppressors uh, wish that I stay within my bounds or that I do whatever uh, they want but not what I want. Uh, then I start to reclaim that, my, my wish, my desire and my body and the way that I don't feel like I'm inferior to the oppressors. That's the whole point of the, uh, of the oppressed. So let's see how I am currently applying those ideas to service design. First of all, in a literal way, then later on in a metaphorical way. Literally, you can already try it out Theater of the Press as a replacement for body storming and experience prototyping. We have done this uh, and we call it design theater. So it's a kind of a theater where we create through theater some reactions to oppression that may, later on may become a service. In this case, uh, our students, our design students, they created this uh, LGBTQ mobile violence alarm app inside as part of a theater session. They didn't have that idea before. So that's the whole point. The idea comes within the situation of violence, as you can see in the picture. And Pombo Cop was a kind of a, uh, a robotized uh, system. That it's a speculative design stuff that will just send some, uh, um, some annoying sounds around people that were committing those kind of violence against LGBT people. And we also have a kind of a structured activity for discussing publicly some controversial uh, service design features, like, for example, si writing silence feature of uh, ride hailing apps like Uber. They deployed this uh, feature in Brazil in 2019. So we organized a theater session asking, is this ethical uh, having uh, this option of asking someone to become silenced before I even meet that person without knowing who the person is. And especially, is this ethical to pay an extra amount because the service was not <laughs> available in the standard uh, service of Uber. So that you have to pay extra to silence the driver. Is this ethical? Is this something that we want to cultivate in our societies? That's what we try to provoke the audience to discuss in this uh, foreign theater session. We also had uh, remote foreign theater sessions after uh, COVID-19 isolation measures. And in these you see designers being put at the side of the press in a Uber of design work called the Fantastic Design Factory. 
Uh, it was held by, uh, uh, it was organized by an artificial intelligence that was asking designers to work for a very cheap price and presenting the work of these designers, these preca precarious designers, as if it was artificially generated in a case that we call heteromation. It's an automation of the other, a person playing out the role of a robot, of a machine, and being completely invisibilized, become completely invisible behind an interface that covers up what's going, really going on. Well, now let's see some more distant uh, uh, work uh, inspired by theater of the press. In this case, I'm more like um, uh, applying the metaphor of uh, theater of the press, which if you recall uh, the diagram before, it's about everyone does everything that is needed, and so everyone is changing their tasks. So there's a kind of a task um, uh, switch, task, uh, task is shifting between people so that everyone knows what's going on, so they don't get alienated by doing only one thing. And we have been following for more than 10 years now so the cultural, collaborative cultural producers of northeast, northeast of Brazil. They use a digital platform that we have designed um, with the purpose of organizing uh, social movements and um, call, uh, uh, small cultural collectives. And as part of this process of organizing, they have to find what, what are the common skills that they share with, among each other. And you see in the middle of this diagram where they are trying to figure out what are the common skills that, that can turn into a service that they can offer to their communities instead of offering what uh, is demanded or they start with what they can offer in terms of uh, their capabilities. And later on, we, uh, we also use some solidarity economy uh, structures to uh, sell and buy those uh, services so they do not need to use uh, official money or Brazilian money in real. They can print their own money and therefore they can start new businesses just by having their capabilities in a place. So they don't uh, depend, for example, on, on government or money for um, doing a lot of things using this solidarity economy scheme. And that's pretty much what theater of the press says. Everyone does everything. So people are shifting, learning uh, new skills by uh, helping out with these different services. Any potential buyer of a service in this solidarity economy is also a potential producer of a service. They can join the service producers anytime so they can collect money and they you can use that money later on to purchase the, the service. It's a little bit complicated. I might have, if you, may, if you have any question later on, we can uh, dig into more in this case. Uh, that, this is an uh, easier to understand uh, case. Um, that it's a coalition design um, project uh, led by one of our design students and she was interested on uh, women coffee work the women coffee uh, work producers in the rural area that ha were not uh, being featured in the packages. Their names were not there. So she was going there and learning why is that so. And then she created an opportunity for the women coffee work producers to meet the women coffee work uh, sellers, the baristas uh, in, the, in the city. So they organized a trip. They met each other and they uh, found ways of joining together in the whole coffee work production chain to fight sexism, which was all behind this work invisibilization. So they joined forces to find uh, the predominance of male uh, leadership in this area. And they even reached out uh, to um, a city council member to uh, influence um, a policy making process. Well, these are just two cases, but uh, to summarize the most important part of them, is that in the Joker system, there's no division between front stage and backstage, and everyone does everything precisely to avoid expert alienation, uh, which is part of this process, um, a, a piece in this puzzle uh, that enables work invisibilization so much. And in the Joker system, people who are originally oppressors, who have power, who have privileges, they can become allies to the oppressed. Uh, but they also need to see themselves as oppressed, even if in a different oppression relation. And let me give you an example from our research. We have identified that being a designer in a capitalist society usually means playing out the role of the oppressor or staying on the side of the oppressors. Well, this is a hard to <laughs> accept 
uh, 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 evidence, but we have published a paper that really um, dig deep into this uh, phenomenon. And users are the oppressed, oppressed side, and people who are historically uh, used to be oppressed, for example, through racism, through sexism, through the ableism, they are also treated as users, and they are also suffering what we call userism. For example, if you go to Google Scholar and try to find black users, you type black users and try black designers, you will see that the amount of results for black users is so much bigger than the amount of results for black uh, designers. That's why black people are considered to be users. And that's the same for other kinds of oppressed people. They are also believed to be users, not designers. Well, designers, they are also oppressed, but in a different relationship. If you consider yourself as a design worker, not a design capitalist, which is the case for most designers, they usually are, uh, they, they need to receive wages to produce their existence. Otherwise, they, they starve. They don't have anything to... Uh, to live on if they don't uh, work for a pro for uh, for wage, that's different from a design capitalist or someone who has accumulated uh, uh, resources and they don't need necessarily to work. If they just if their companies are broke, they still have some resources left for them to uh, continue existing. That's the difference between a class a book called bourgeoisie and a class called proletariat. Uh, and it's still very much in place in capitalism. And if you identify yourself as a wage, worked, a wage worker, you can uh, somehow draw an analogy to what is to be a black user, for example, oppressed in, uh, in the user oppression that we have showed before. It's not the same, but some principles of, for example, uh, feeling yourself less than someone else's, that's similar because the design worker always feels uh, like I have something less than the CEO, the founder of the company. They are the shiny stars. They are the creative founders. And that usually uh, blocks you from seeing what is the going, really going on, which is they have more resources. <laughs> it's not they are genius. They are more creative than you. It's just because they have access to resources that you can't have. Well, we are running a lot of online and, and physical workshops uh, in the Design and Oppression Network. It's a, a group of researchers that uh, formed in 2020 to find oppression in the design field. And in the, through these workshops, a lot of people have realized that they are oppressed, but they are also oppressors in different relationships that sometimes you use the word positionality to describe this process of understanding your role, your place in the world and how do you relate to these different oppression relations. And we experimented many different ways of doing remotely uh, theater of the oppressed, for example, playing out with 3D bodies and uh, enacting some uh, oppressive situations using those um, puppets, the 3D puppets. But I have to say, a remote theater of the oppressed is possible, but it's always less deep than in-person theater of the press workshops. And that's why I invite you all to join the CEFDES conference in, that will be held in, in July 2023. And th that will be happening in Rio de Janeiro. That's my hometown, also Fernando's hometown. I'm going to uh, host a, a theater of the techno press workshop together with Bibiana Serpa, who's also one of the founders in the Design and Oppression Network. And I guess Fernando is also a, a co-host of this event and he will, be happy, he will probably be very happy to welcome you in our hometown. Right, Fernando? So that's all I wanted to uh, present to you. Thank you very much. And I'm really glad to uh, join a discussion or dialogue if that works.